Changes to continuing practice development, otherwise known as CPD, are coming, not just for anaesthetists, but for all doctors. And I'm here to guide you through them. Thank you for joining me on the Australian Anesthesia Podcast. I'm Susie New from the Australian Society of Anesthetists, and here you'll find me talking about all things relevant to anesthesia in Australia. In this episode, I'm chatting with Dr. Vida Viliunas. Vida is the Vice President of the Australian Society of Anesthetists, otherwise known as the ASA, Chair of the ASA's Education Committee, and has for longer than I can remember been one of the people who oversees CPD certification for ASA members. So I couldn't think of anyone better to sit down and discuss with me the changes that are coming to CPD in 2024. As I said, not just for anaesthetists, but for all doctors practicing in Australia. All right, let's get into it. Thank you, Vida, for chatting with me. Congratulations, first of all, on becoming the Vice President of the ASA. I hope so far it is going well for you. Yes, thank you very much. Like many things in life, it's probably a mixed blessing. I do look <laughs> forward to the first person who calls me Veep. That still hasn't happened, <laughs> but everybody's on notice from now on. I used to uh, always refer to myself when I was in that role as the president of Vice. <laughs> so I, I think Veep is uh, less of a mouthful. So I'll start using that term, shall I? You're also chair of the Education Committee of the ASA. That's right. And thus have intimate knowledge of the CPD changes that are coming our way in 2024. So this is a great opportunity, I thought, to go through this with you. So it looks like and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like the biggest change at the moment is that the requirements for the CPD programs are coming out of the Medical Board of Australia. Correct. There are probably two big changes, maybe three, depending on how you classify them. The Medical Board decided last year, just at a time when we were emerging from a pandemic, from those diabolical years, they thought it would be a good idea to disrupt CPD. <laughs> Why not? For better or for worse, it is here. So that now, let me confine my remarks to anaesthetists. Now anaesthetists have a choice of their CPD home. They can choose to go with the college CPD program that is well established and subscribed to by most anaesthetists or the only non-college AMC accredited CPD home, which is the AMA a DP learning program. Okay, so AMC being the Australian Medical Council. Correct. That accredits the... The CPD homes. So they've delegated the job of creating a CPD program to either a college or the AMA. Okay. The other thing that the Medical Board of Australia changed was to change the mix of CPD. It's weighted heavily towards reviewing performance and measuring outcomes. So in one year... You have to do 50 hours of CPD. 25 of those hours need to be in the domain of reviewing performance and measuring outcomes. 12.5 hours are reserved for traditional learning or educational activities, the CPD knowledge and skills sorts of things. And 12.5 hours are free. Okay. There are other imposed elements by the medical board, and they are relating to these elements. Culturally safe practice. The medical board does not prescribe what things you have to do. An individual program might prescribe a culturally safe activity, but the medical board does not say you have to do this particular thing. It just right. says that amongst your CPD, there must be an element of culturally safe practice. Right. The addressing of health inequities, yeah. professionalism and ethical practice. Okay. Do they ascribe a certain amount of time that needs to be spent on these activities? No. No, you just have to do those amongst your array of activities and be able mm -hmm. to identify them. Okay. In addition, of course, there are specialist requirements and for anaesthetists, that is one emergency activity per year. That's what the MBA says. Okay. And of course, you have to create a plan and then create a reflection. Is that part of the medical board requirements? Absolutely it is. That doesn't have to be particularly onerous, but it is a logical part of learning. And that is the current zeitgeist landscape of teaching and learning. 
Yes. If you don't have a plan of how to get to your learning objectives, you'll never get there. I was going to say, it's like when you go to a course or a lecture and they start with, these are our learning objectives. So you're writing your own learning objectives. And this is also on an annual basis, not like the college's triennium. Correct. A lot of people were became anxious about the change in the program, concerned that this would be a much harder program. If you do the maths, we used to have to do 180 credits, which was about 180 hours over three years, which is 60 hours per year. So now it's 50 hours a year. I'm not saying it's easier. I'm saying it is achievable. And that's what I think. I think a lot about CPD. I know a little bit more about CPD than is probably healthy for anyone, but I think CPD should be meaningful. I think it should be practically achievable and... I think this program is practically achievable for busy clinicians. You can be cynical about it and just tick off the requirements if you wish, or you can engage in continuous professional development as most of us do. The program is designed to ensure that there is a basic minimum of CPD done by everybody. Yeah. And I think Just to try and map it a little bit, because I know a lot of people will be used to the college program. Sure. So the the college requires that you do, as you said, 180, works out to be roughly hours over the triennium with a minimum of 30 every year. And then a significant part of that, so 100 of the 180 are in the category of practice evaluation. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that maps to the MBAs, the medical board's, category of that 25 hours on reviewing performance and measuring outcomes. Is that how you see them? I think all programs are going to be yearly from now on. Exactly. Because the medical board is saying it should all be an annual program now. So coming back to the early questions, we used to have to do, I've just pulled it up, but a hundred credits or a hundred points in practice evaluation over the triennium. Yes. Whereas we now have to do 25 hours a year in that, would you say those categories are similar? So the college had practice evaluation, the medical board has review of performance and measuring outcomes. Correct. That's exactly what they are intended to be coherent with. Yeah. Yeah. 25 is 25 per year. And then there's 12.5 knowledge and skills and 12.5 hours at your discretion If it was me, I would knock over my knowledge and skills with 25 hours of knowledge and skills and then focus on how I can do the reviewing performance and measuring out, achieve those points. They're a little bit harder, particularly if you're not in a public institution where you don't have those automatic M&M meetings and case discussions, multidisciplinary sessions that are not always available to people in private practice. Yeah, exactly. And then the 12 and a half hours of learning maps to that knowledge and skills component. Mm. And then as we said, the college program has two emergency responses, but the medical board requires you to only do one yeah. as a specialist anaesthetist. Yeah. But if the college uh, is your CPD home, you have to follow their program. And you can move anywhere for your CPD home. And if you elect to move elsewhere, then you don't have to follow the college program. No, it's a different program. The AMA program is a different program. It is practically achievable. Yep. That's what it is. Okay. And it's always been hard to get those practice evaluation points, or in this case, it's called review of performance and measuring outcomes. And as you say, a lot of people in private find it really hard. So you went through some examples before of what those activities are. So you've mentioned the classic M&M meeting. What other ones might be available for people? Yeah. Yeah. So what we started to do here in sunny Canberra, we started to run case discussions, morbidity and mortality meetings on Zoom. They are legitimate professional development activities and they will qualify for those reviewing performance and measuring outcomes activities. In addition, for example, at the NSC, we ran a number of morbidity and mortality meetings. Here at our own Art of Anesthesia meeting, we ran an interactive CPD discussion with a small group of people who brought their own cases to discuss, and it was a meaningful exchange of ideas and satisfied the reviewing performance and measuring outcomes requirements. So to look at 
for M&M meetings to occur. You've got your hospital ones. You can just get a group of colleagues together. Yes. And I've done a podcast on getting a peer group together and there's a document to support that. And you can also look to attending them at the major conferences. Oh, yeah, the regional meetings. The other thing that I would like to mention, this podcast does qualify as a knowledge and skills online experience for which the proof of participation would be a screenshot of the subject of the podcast and its duration. Oh, there you go. There's a wealth of knowledge and skills domain elements on the ASA website and If you're cynical about CBD, you can certainly complete all of your knowledge and skills requirements just on our website. Great. Great plug. So 25 hours of listening to this podcast, or if you get tired of the sound of my voice, which I don't blame you, then go to the ASA Ed page, which stands for ASA Education. And there's a whole bunch. And I think also the most recent NSC, the National Scientific Congress, there's a whole lot of that content available now on demand after the conference that's available for three months. So things like that would also help you fulfill your knowledge and skills component. Yeah. And I was a little bit mystified by the Medical Board of Australia requirements to make sure that we have elements of our CPD that included the addressing of health inequities, professionalism and ethical practice. Those are words, I speak English well, I understand the vocabulary, but I wasn't quite sure how I would fulfil a CPD activity in relation to those things. So what did I do? Like most of us, I just Googled addressing health inequities in anesthesia. And there is some interesting literature on that subject. Similarly, as we know, there are articles and workshops and sessions at meetings that address professionalism in anesthesia. Yeah. Well, I was just teaching at the real world anesthesia course, and we certainly discussed a lot of those aspects in terms of cultural safety and professionalism and ethical practice on a global level and the contribution that anaesthetists make to it. So there you go. People who went to the RWAC course can potentially log that time. And of course, volunteering is another thing that is claimable as a CPD activity. What category would that fit under? In DP learning, it falls under the heading of reviewing performance and measuring outcomes. So interestingly, volunteer work in the college program comes under knowledge and skills. Correct. For the DP learning program, the AMA CPD home, it comes under quality teaching and learning as a volunteer, which is in domain two, reviewing performance and measuring outcomes. Oh, so so the difficult. It's just a different categorization. Yeah. Okay. And that's the more difficult to attain categorization. Yeah. Yeah. Also, that's interesting, especially for someone like me who does a lot of work overseas and struggles to get those points in that practice evaluation category. And as we've had many discussions before, as I'm sure occurred in your real world anesthesia course, you do spend a lot of time doing those activities regarding reviewing performance and measuring outcomes when you go to another country because you do a needs assessment and you need to be very careful about outcomes, as we always are, of course, for everyone. All about learning in those environments. That would be more my experience of working in developing countries is it's much more about learning and looking at the impact of what technologies you're leaving behind. Yeah, so I understand that classification. Okay, well, that's good to know. All right, a couple last few questions. One is that as of 1st of January 2024, all doctors will need to have a CPD home, whereas before CPD was something for specialists. So our pre-vocational doctors will have to register. Our vocational trainees need to follow the college program? Yes, yes. But pre-vocational people need to have a CPD home, that is correct. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, for trainees it makes most sense that their CPD home is the college because they are doing so much activities with the college. And, of course, financially it makes more sense rather than having a separate CPD home. Yes. We've talked a little bit and I I haven't touched on it, but I really want to dive into it now. So the AMA has got DP Learning or DPL standing for Doctor Portal Learning, of which the ASA is an investor. And you, Well, how have you been involved with DP Learning? As I said, I, I know a little bit too much about CPD that is probably better for my health. But the ASA has long been associated with the auditing of members who don't follow the college program 
prior to this 2023-2024 change. Simon Macklin and I used to audit the submissions so that the ASA could, in, with a clear conscience, issue certificates of compliance. But with the new medical board announcement regarding CPD homes, the ASA moved to make a commitment to partner with the AMA's DP Learning Program. And I have joined the CPD Advisory Committee with the AMA to make sure that we have a defensible and practically achievable program that will continue to satisfy the Australian Medical Council accreditation. Lovely. So just to recap, there's been specialists amongst us who, for whatever reason, haven't done their CPD through the college Mm -hmm. and the ASA has looked after their needs in terms of providing certification and supporting them in attaining their CPD. So if you're a member and you're in that category, we haven't forgotten about you. We'll still offer that support. We're just doing it now through the AMA's DP learning platform. Correct. Great. So what does that involve for people who want to have the AMA as their CPD home? This is a program to which you have to prescribe. There is a small added cost for ASA members and that is $440 currently, which is a very realistic fee and a very user-friendly fee, I think, in addition to your ASA membership. And it provides a very useful tracking dashboard, very similar to other programs. Okay. So for that $440, you get access to a tracking platform. Is it web-based? Is there an app as well? There is a mobile web app that's being developed and there is a very nice desktop program that is able to be used. In addition, there are lots of resources, particularly for those second domain learning activities that concern reviewing performance and measuring outcomes, such as there's an online activity that you can do relating to ethical practice that's Uh very achievable, it doesn't take very long, and it gives you a certain number of hours of activity do. So those resources available through that DP. Yeah, and there are a lot of free activities that you can do within the DPL program. Because I suppose with the AMA behind it, there'll be a lot of resources that, for example, GPs will have access to, and there's no reason why us as specialists, anaesthetists or pre-vocational doctors could also use those resources for our professional development. Is that right? Yes. And they are constantly being reviewed, refreshed and added to in an effort to make busy clinicians' lives less burdened and not more burdened. I think we've all been concerned about the increasing number of requirements by hospitals, by other bureaucratic institutions for us to do more and more with less and less. I think it's about time we got a break and we need to be able to demonstrate to the regulator, that's the medical board, and to the community that we are keeping up with developments. So for the 440, you get access to the platform, you get access to some of the learning materials that will be written presumably for all doctors, but will still be applicable to anaesthetists. Yes. And do you get a certificate at the end of the year? Yes, you do. There's an automatically generated certificate. There is a certain proportion of people who will be audited as required by the program and as required by the Australian Medical Council, which is only natural. That is as you would expect. Yep. And you get an automatic certificate that will satisfy the requirements of the hospitals that require you to submit those. I think it's been really clear. I think I've got a really good understanding now of what needs to be done in terms of the new program for next year. There's the option of, for me personally, staying with the college program or potentially migrating and and checking out the AMA product. Is there anything else that you want to say about the new CPD program that's coming in next year? Sometimes it is a little bit confusing, but as I said, the ASA is here to help and I think we all should be there to help each other achieve the requirements that exist for CPD. I don't think they are unreasonable and I think they are achievable even in a busy clinical practice. Clinical or non-clinical practice. In fact, if you're a non-clinical anaesthetist, it may be a little bit harder to achieve. Yeah. But I've been in correspondence with people who don't actually have interactions with patients, and that is a little bit tricky if you want to maintain your registration. But, again, doable. 
That's true. Even if you don't have contact with patients, but you still want to be a medical practitioner, you still need to fulfill CPD requirements in order to maintain your registration. Absolutely. And it's a coherent logic, isn't it? Yeah. And it says for emergency responses and emergency responses required each year for all participants, except for those who have no direct patient care. Oh, there you go. All right. Okay. Well, look, lovely. Thank you for having this chat with me. It's been really useful and it's, I hope, really clarified some concerns or questions from people going forwards into next year. Anything I can do to make it easier would be my pleasure. Thank you. Well, I hope you found that conversation helpful and feel confident about navigating the changes that are coming soon. As you heard, Vida and I discussed the AMA CPD Home, otherwise known as DPL or DP Learning, which stands for Doctor Portal Learning. We also noted some of the differences as compared to the college program. In my opinion, it looks like it'll be easier, for me anyway, to get those hours up in Domain 2, Reviewing Performance and Measuring Outcomes, which I know for many of us have been the harder points to get. So if you'd like to look at the AMA CPD Home Program for yourself, the DPL program, it's available as a downloadable PDF and of course I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Vida and I also discuss the many educational offerings from the ASA that can count towards your CPD. I put a link to them, the ASA Education page, the ASA Events page and the National Scientific Congress to name a few. Don't forget, as she says, to include listening to this podcast. The back catalogue is on the ASA website or wherever you find your podcasts. If you have any questions about the coming changes to the CPD program, or if there was anything in this podcast that didn't make sense, then feel free to email me. I love hearing from you. The best email is podcast at asa.org.au. All right, until the next episode, which is due out in two weeks' time, I hope you are staying safe and well out there. Thank you for listening to the Australian Anesthesia Podcast, which can be found on all the major podcast hosting platforms, as well as YouTube. This podcast is produced by the Australian Society of Anesthetists and hosted by Dr. Susie New with music created by Dr. Mark Seuss. The ASA was formed in 1934, and our vision is for every anesthetist in Australia to be at their best, providing the highest quality anesthesia and perioperative care through excellent technical and non-technical skills. We also hope that this means that you are functioning at your best when you're away from work. In this podcast, we have conversations that seek to inform, challenge and inspire you to keep you performing at your best. Members of the ASA can access full versions of all episodes by logging into the ASA website at asa.org.au. If you are listening on your favourite podcast app, then make sure you look at the episode notes for the direct link to the podcast on the ASA website. Also, feel free to follow or subscribe so that you can receive the latest episodes as we do publish regularly. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to email us on podcast at asa.org.au. Thank you for your time and we hope you enjoyed listening.